it is a blessing to be in a place where you get to preach God's word no matter where that place is the spiritual blessing of preaching God's word can be found anywhere on the globe if you have God's word and you're able to preach it especially if you're in a place where you're allowed to preach it then that's nice because you can preach it loudly you can preach it openly without having to hide yourself from the local authorities but I will say on the physical side of the blessing it is nice to preach God's word in an air-conditioned building Sometimes we forget some of the physical blessings that we, that we have while enjoying our spiritual blessings. I know that our focus when we come here isn't on the fact that this building feels comfortable. It's not what our focus is on. But I tell you what, it can sometimes help us focus on the Word. I don't know about you, um, I didn't have to go to India to find that out about myself. I went to summer camp. I remember the incredible difficulty the entire week. I went to, it was Jerry Martin's week at Indian Creek Youth Camp. I'd never been there before. And it's amazing what they've done there. They built this building and they designed it perfectly to trap every bit of heat in the county <laughs> inside that building. And um, I remember how difficult it was uh, with that incredible heat. Heat does something to us. I remember how difficult that made that made it to, to stay alert. But also, you learn from that. I learned from that in India. We go to India and someone will preach the gospel, and you have that heat, and it's all day long, and you maybe come in the evening, and it's still hot, and you've been hot all day, and heat just drains you. But the, we were there, and this man was, was speaking on the scripture, and he was talking about the scripture that he quoted. I couldn't tell you the reference. But it regarded um, hearkening to God's word. Give attention to God's Word. And I remember in that moment I thought, you know, the reason that sometimes maybe I struggle with, especially when it's been hot all day, it's been a long day, we've traveled, the reason I struggle with staying awake when I'm hearing a sermon, I could just blame the speaker and say he's, he's dry, but he's speaking God's Word. So my difficulty might be that I'm not hearkening to God's Word. And I said, well, how will I hearken to God's word? And what I did, at least in India, and what I'm trying to continue now, is sitting up a little bit. Another physical blessing we have is these padded pews. But don't we tend to slouch down in them? And so I did this trick with myself where I said, I'm going to hearken to God's word. So I leaned forward, and I would just kind of give my ear to the speaker. Lean forward and say, I'm eager. I want to get a little bit closer to that. I want, to, I want to hear it, and I want to catch every single word. And so by my posture, I would make that possible. It's, 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 it's interesting that when we put ourselves in different situations, we learn different things about the gospel. When we put ourselves in different situations, not so much the gospel. The gospel stays the same whether you're in America or in India. But you learn things about yourself, things you take for granted and things you don't. And I understand that many of you made it possible for me to go to India. And as we go into our sermon this afternoon, I want you to understand that when you support uh, me, and, and, and some of you even supported Josh, some of you supported Edison, when you support us to go to India, it is for the benefit of the Indian people, yes. It's for the gospel to go there and, to, and to, for those who are there and, and teaching the gospel, primarily our goal, to strengthen them, but really, truly, the blessing extends to us. Every time I go to India, the trip is always very different. Even though I go to the same place, the trip is very different, and it strengthens me. My challenge when I come back and I give a report is to give Scripture that, ten, that lends itself to offering you from God's Word, to the best of my ability, what I gained while I was there. And each trip has been different. And if I could sum up this trip in one scripture, it would be Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And it was amazing because you don't know, I don't know anyway, maybe different people experience mission trips differently. Maybe I'm just a wimp and I, I'm not good at, at, at dealing with being in another culture. I don't know. But I do know this, 
that I experience it different every time. And this time was so fitting. I didn't know it to begin with. But when we got there, they had not prepared the apartment for us. So we walk in this place, and, you know, it's dirty. And, and, uh, and my friend Ramesh says, oh, and by the way, the toilet doesn't work, so don't use the toilet. <laughs> okay. And uh, then uh, I think Edison or Josh goes over and hits the button for the water. You know, you can't drink the water. You have to drink it out of a filter, and the filter's broken. And <laughs> there's no water. And they said, oh, we don't have groceries yet, but we'll go tomorrow and get groceries. And we're looking at each other like we haven't eaten. We've been traveling, you know, airplane food. And we're hungry. And we didn't have food to eat. And it was going to be a struggle to find, we could find water to drink, but we were going to have to go around different places to get our water. And that just really stressed me out. And it's easy in moments like that to lose focus on the reason that I'm here. But why did I come here? And you know, that's easy enough to see in the application of a mission trip. But what about our daily lives? Are we seeking first the kingdom of God in our daily lives? Because just as much as if you went into a place and it wasn't really prepared for your physical needs. It wasn't really prepared to meet your physical needs. Just as much if you're in a place where every physical need you could possibly want is met. And you can have whatever you want all the time. The exact opposite is true, then you end up with the same problem, which is what? I can lose my focus on why I'm here. We are the richest people. When you look at the type of food you can eat, that will tell you right there that we're as rich as any king or queen of antiquity. One of the great signs of wealth in, in antiquity was when you went to the king's table, there was this great spread of foods that no one else ate. We live that way. We're kings and queens. We can eat whatever we want. We have an unlimited amount of food we can eat and an unlimited types of food we can eat, all kinds of delicacies. We are so over blessed that we have to go on diets to restrict all the foods we can have. We have homes that are air conditioned, that we have soft beds. Oh, if you could only talk to Josh, he slept on, hey, he brought it on himself. We offered him more mattresses, but he was, I think, kind of proud of his, his sacrifice. He slept on wooden slats with one little tiny thin mattress over it the entire month. And, um, we sleep on these soft beds. We, we have these blessings. We have our televisions. We have our, our nice cars that we can drive in. Uh, we have here uh, a, a, a nice, clean, yes, our city is clean, a nice, clean city uh, by comparison. Our air is clean to breathe. What I want to focus our minds on for a moment is leave, try to think of those things that are the physical blessings of your life. You have a lot of them. I have a lot of them. The person in here who has the least amount of money has a lot of physical blessings simply by the fact that you live in the United States of America. Think about those things. Think about the things that you enjoy that are physical in nature. Think about your refrigerator right now. If your refrigerator is like my refrigerator, I remember getting home and just being shocked because in India we had this tiny refrigerator and we couldn't get it full. And I came home, and there's this massive refrigerator, and I can't fit anything into it. And so you say, just think about the, the condition of your refrigerator right now. Your pantry. The gas station that you could walk to either direction if you leave the church building, and what they have available there, and if you have enough money in your pocket or a credit card that you could go down there and get whatever you want. The car you're going to get in to go home today. It may not be pretty, but I... But I Bet it has air conditioning. It may be pretty. Think about those physical blessings for a moment and consider the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 14 when he said, if any man comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, even his wife and his children, even himself, he's not worthy of me. Except a man take up his cross and follow after me, he is not worthy of me. He said he's not able to be my disciple. 
Paul, in regards to all those things of which he could be proud, Paul didn't live in the lavish environment we live in, but all the things that he had to be proud of, when considering them, compared to his service for the Lord, he said, I count them as refuse. I count the blessings I have. I count what I could be proud of in my life. I count it as refuse when I compare it to who I am in the Lord. So take all those blessings in your life and hold them in your mind and just think of it this way. If they were to disappear tomorrow, everybody, you know, they always make the movies about everything going bad and you've got to be on the run and, and you lose everything. If everything that is your physical blessing were to disappear tomorrow, would it change your identity? The question comes down to Matthew 6.33. Am I seeking first the kingdom of God? Because if I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, then no matter what day I ever wake up and roll out of bed, no matter what happens that day, no matter what I gain or lose that day, the number one thing in my life will be accomplished. Because never will a day come when I cannot seek God first. There might be a day that comes where I can't open up a refrigerator and find it full. There might be a day that comes that I can't go out and get in a nice vehicle and drive somewhere. There might be a day that comes that I perhaps don't even have a nice, comfortable home to live in. Those days could come for any one of us or for all of us. But the day will not come when I cannot get up out of my nice, comfortable bed or I cannot get up off of the ground from my sleep at the night before when I was sleeping on the ground. No matter where I wake up, I can seek God first. The scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. The first thing we want to focus on is this, this concept of ye, seek ye. Now I have to, I have to tell, for, I have to disclose for the sake of honesty that this picture was set up. I wasn't actually having a Bible study with these guys at this time, um, but I was representing Josh here. Josh did have a Bible study with these two young men, and we discussed the scriptures and had a study, but not right here. We sat there and we were discussing scriptures after Josh had his Bible study with them. He had a lengthy Bible study with them outside. But these young men are no strangers to the Bible. They've been studying the Bible with the local preacher there, Lali. What's interesting about them is that they are two young men who are among the wealthiest in this city. They're extremely wealthy young men. They're the only Indians I've ever met that have played Xbox. They're just very wealthy. They, they, have, they live in a nice apartment. Their parents are, are, have government jobs. Uh, they yet, and their parents, mind you, are not New Testament Christians. Nor do their parents attend the services. Nor do their parents have Bible studies with the preacher or Josh or any of us. These young men use the money that they have to pay to come from a great distance to come to Lalit's house, which is that's where that picture is taken, to have Bible studies with Lalit, the preacher. They came on that day, a great distance at their own expense, of their own free will, to come and have a Bible study with, with the visiting preachers, uh, this today being Josh. I was out doing personal work uh, elsewhere when, when they arrived. They went back home to their nice apartment with their nice things, yet woke up the next morning early, used their own funds to return again at a great distance for the worship assembly. And they do this on a regular basis. Seek ye. The first thing about this is, he, this is a very personal statement made by the Lord. I cannot seek for you, and you cannot seek God's kingdom for me. No matter how much I love my children, I cannot seek God's kingdom for them. No matter how much I love my spouse, I cannot seek the Lord's kingdom for her. You cannot seek the Lord's kingdom for him. You can't do it. Children who have parents that aren't believing, like these, like these young men, you cannot seek the Lord's kingdom for your parents. There's just no possibility, no matter how much I care about a person, no matter how much I want that person to obey the gospel, there's no possibility for me to do the seeking for them. This is an individual command given to every single individual that will ever live, which is what? Seek ye. You seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. These young men understood that and they did that. 
Now, this is one of my favorite pictures from the trip. I don't know how well you could make that out. Edison memorized a lot of scriptures and studied his Bible a lot while we were there. He took my class. Not only did he take my class, but and, and we had a lot of memory work. Um, you guys at MSOP, you only think you have a lot of memory work until you get the last, the last class for the graduating class of this school. They just pile the memory work on them. And I went downstairs one day and I said to Ramesh, the, pr the principal of the school, I said, man, this, I said, what do I do, Ramesh? I I've got two semesters worth of memory work and we've only got one month. And Ramesh answered like this. He said, well, I guess they will have to suffer. <laughs> and uh, so Edison got to partake of that. And this, I walked into our bedroom. We shared a bedroom. And I walked into our bedroom and uh, Edison had fallen asleep in the chair. <laughs> studying his memory work and um, it's personal and, and I really like this picture because uh, sometimes early on I'd say Edison have you studied your memory work Edison have you done your studying Edison have you done your studying and this particular time we were both Josh and I were both like where is Edison no one told him to go study he had settled into it he was enjoying it he was benefiting from it and he had gone in there and like I said it's hot and you get tired he had gone in there and sat down in that chair and gradually fallen asleep uh, with God's word in front of him. And, but it, the, the other thing about this picture that, that makes me think is we fall asleep doing a lot of things. You know this is true because you probably in the last month have fallen asleep watching a movie or a television show or something like that. Something fun we fall asleep doing. I don't fish, but I imagine I would fall asleep if I tried fishing. That's why I don't fish. But we, we, we do things that we enjoy that are, that are physical in nature, and we fall asleep doing them. What a blessing it is. I got a text from a father of one of our young people who we had encouraged uh, to be studying his Bible more. I got a text from the father, similar picture. He had fallen asleep with his head on the, on the Bible. What a blessing it is when we're seeking God's kingdom to the point that we fall asleep not with not with the video game, our little character on the video game running into a wall in front of us. Some of you have done that. Not with that show, it, I wake up when that show, I fell asleep in front of my television watching that show or that movie. But what a blessing when it's a regular occurrence for me that, that I fall asleep with my Bible in front of me. I, I fall asleep because... I'm very tired, but I just want to get a little bit more out of God's Word. I need sleep, but I need God's Word even more. Seek first. I don't know how well you can make out. I think the only thing you can make out is the uh, bright redhead sticking his head out of that rickshaw. But we were loading up. This is our first day in, in a state called Tiripura. We had flown over there. Um, that we're in the, the capital city of Agartala, and we've, we're loading into the rickshaws to go out and, and do marketplace evangelism. The whole reason we went to Agartala was not even really, honestly, truly, for the Indian people. It was for us. Um, I had hoped that a, a man named Lalit would be there the whole month, and Edison would be able to work with him, and we'd be able to work with him, and be encouraged by him, because Lalit, if you remember those of you who were here from my report last year, is a very unique man. He is powerful in the scriptures, and he does not ever meet a person who does not learn about Jesus and get a tract. So Lalit wasn't there when we got there. He had moved to Agartala, so we booked plane tickets, and one weekend we were going to Agartala. And we say seek first because here's the thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. There's a lot of things you could think about when you got into the rickshaw. I usually think about where are we going to get our water? it's going to be hot and we have no water we need to stop and get water we need to stop and get some food you think about the physical things Lalit gets in that rickshaw and I knew this would happen so I they tried to get me to get in the rickshaw with him I said no and if you can see in there I don't know if we can see well enough we put Josh and Edison Lalit's in the middle you can't really see him so well but uh, we drive down to the place that's out at this park where we can where we can just walk and talk to people and teach them the gospel and we get there and 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 Josh gets out of the rickshaw and he's just got this big smile on his face. He goes, man, that was awesome. He said, what? And he said, Lalit just preached to that man the whole way here. 
And then when we got here, he gave him a tract. And he said, he got started, and he looked at me, and he said, Brother Josh, would you like to say something? I'll translate. And Josh said, I told him a couple things, and I thought it was pretty good. And then Lalit just kind of ignored me the rest of the time and just preached in the, in the, in the native language to the man the entire time. And every time they got in a rickshaw, and anytime you go anywhere with Lalit, that's all he's doing. The first thing on Lalit's mind when he wakes up in the morning is, who am I going to teach the gospel to today? The first concern Lalit has if you're at a gas station is not getting gas. It's, am I going to be able to teach this man the gospel? If you go to eat, he's not worried about what he's going to order off the menu. He's worried about how he's going to get the gospel taught to this person that's bringing us the food. It's the reason I wanted to go be near him. How do I learn to seek first the kingdom of God? It's not so hard to seek the kingdom of God. I, I want to be a part of the kingdom. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. I want to be a servant of Jesus. What's difficult is, how do I put it first when there's so many things in life that I want and I need? Some things I think I need, and I don't really need, I just want them. And some things I think I want, and I find out I didn't really want them. But in my state... I'm seeking things. How do I make sure that on a daily basis and, and with my brother Lalit on an hourly and, and by the minute basis that the first thing I'm seeking is God's kingdom? And the answer that I think that I've learned from Lalit is, is very simple. Lalit told me, and you, any of us can do this if we, if we try, Lalit told me, brother, did you know I have an ear problem? And I said, no. He said, yes, back when I was a selfish man, my ears started hurting. Uh, before I obeyed the gospel, he said they would hurt. And I, went, I waited and waited, and finally I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, we cannot fix your ears, but we can pour some metal inside them, and it will stop the damage from getting worse, but you'll always have a ringing in your ears. Permanent, you ever hear of a ringing in your ears? Well, Lee has it permanently in both ears at all times. And I said, that's terrible. He said, no, it's a very good reminder uh, that I need to be working for God and not being selfish. And so this man has this constant ringing in his ears, and so constantly, he says, that's his permanent reminder. Serve the Lord, don't serve yourself. And if he ever forgets it, he just listens to the ringing in his ears. What is it in my life that I can set as a reminder not to be selfish? What is it in my life? How can I, and this is true, different for every person here, but how will I set a reminder? How will I uh, establish it? What scripture will I put on my doorpost to remind me and my family when we walk into our home that, as Brother Moser told us this morning, this isn't mine, it's the Lord's. And it's not my focus, God is. That's a personal thing. That's a you thing. That's a me thing. We have to determine what that's going to be. But I do know that I cannot seek second or third, or first, the kingdom of God, and be pleasing to Jesus. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Met this young man, actually met his father in line when we were going through the, to the, at the airport, and he had to jump out of line for a moment to put something through the conveyor, and he was going to have to go all the way back to the line. And I said, no, just go in front of me, it's fine, you were already in line. And he was extremely appreciative. Well, as it turned out, we saw him the whole rest of our trip. And I managed to make contact with his son. They were taking his son to go to engineering school. Very proud of him. He's very proud that he's going to get to go to school to be an engineer. It's a great thing if you have that opportunity in, in India. But our conversation was what? And our continued conversation through email. It's great that you are a success as a young man. But you can't seek being a successful young man first. You can't seek engineering first. First, you get with my friend Lalit in your city and you seek God. Don't seek engineering first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. There's a particular thing we're seeking. We can seek a lot of things in life, and there's a lot of things in life we should seek, but the kingdom of God is our aim, and it is our goal, and the lovely thing about going on a mission trip into a foreign land is that you get to see the kingdom of God does not look like um, uh, really high ceilings with, with, with green pews. This is what the, this is, these faces and these people that meet in this building is what the kingdom of God looks like to me. When I think of God's kingdom, I think of our church family. It's a blessing to go to another place and see people who don't even speak our language. Most of the people in this picture don't even speak our language. And where are they meeting? That's Lalit on the far right. Sorry, I'm pointing back there. That's Lalit on the far right. Where are they meeting? That is his dining room. 
And while we were there, it was his bedroom. They slept in their, in their dining room. And they clear everything out of that little room, and we cram it full of Christians, and we have the worship assembly. The boys... I don't know if you can make them out, but they're on that back wall, and they've brought more friends from their school to come hear the gospel preached. And then every, pretty much everybody else is uh, our New Testament Christians. There's a uniqueness in India to the Lord's church. We noticed it so strongly. While we were in this place, and we're talking about the kingdom of God, Lalit took us to the house of a man, and that man was one of the head preachers of that city. And he had just held a conference. Just before we got there, he had held a conference for all the pastors and preachers of the region to come together. And Lalit went, and he sat there. And they talked about all these different things and the materials they were using and what they were going to do. And finally, as they were about to end, this head preacher man stood up and he said, is there anybody else that would like to say anything? Well, Lee, well, Lee raised his hand. Can I have two minutes? Two minutes. And the man said, yes. So Lalit got up there and gave them a sermon on John 17. Said, the Lord pray we be one, and you guys are teaching every different doctrine. And he said, and Jesus said that in vain you worship me if you teach for, for doctrine and the commandments of men. And he said, so how can we vainly Uh, vainly worshiping Jesus, teach many different doctrines when the Lord prayed in the garden that we be one even as he and the Father are one. And I don't know what all else he said, but it was enough to where when Lalit took us to visit this man, this man wanted us to help him rebuke Lalit. He was sorely disappointed by the conversation. But there's something that kept coming up with that man. We studied the scriptures together and and we, we talked about how Paul became a Christian and we talked about the the, the church that Paul was a member of, and how that, that we've got to seek the kingdom of God. We don't seek your church, this man's church, uh, the people who came here a hundred years ago and gave a bunch of money to build a building. We don't seek those churches. We seek the Lord's kingdom. And the man's final conclusion from that whole discussion was this. And you're going to see that man's son in, in, in just a minute on the slides. But his final conclusion to it was this. Well... I like to get along with the others. You see that there is a distinctive truth of how to obey the gospel. Yeah, I see that. But you won't teach it, no. You see there is a distinctive church in the Bible that that Jesus built. I see that. But you won't seek after it, no. We are not seeking church. You turn on the TV and the pastor will tell you, Say this prayer, go join the church of your choice. We're not seeking to be churched. We are seeking the Lord's church, the Lord's kingdom, the kingdom of God. If I go and find a church that some man built, all I have done is seek the kingdom of men. Men built that. But there is one kingdom for which the Son of God came to this earth, lived a sinless life, and died on the cross thereafter being resurrected and ascended to heaven. There's one kingdom he did that for, and it's the kingdom for which we must search. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. There's the church gathered at the house of Lalit outside of his home. That's the kingdom of God. Those are our brothers and sisters in Christ. You'll notice the kingdom does not look like people wearing coats and ties and dress shoes on the Lord's Day. As a matter of fact, I think very few people in that assembly even had shoes on. It challenges our thoughts of what the kingdom looks like. I wear a coat and tie on the Lord's Day. I enjoy wearing a coat and tie on the Lord's Day. I don't in India, but here in the United States I do. It challenges us, it challenges us when you go and you meet those people. Look what they're wearing, most of them T-shirts. They're, 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 they're putting on what clothes they can, and they come in, and their customs, and their custom is to take their shoes off at the door. And you end up in a worship assembly where you look around, and nobody has shoes on, and you think, is this the kingdom of God? And the answer is, yes, stop focusing on the carnal. Spiritually, what are we doing? We're partaking of the five acts of worship as we're commanded by God. These are people who have been immersed in water for the remission of their sins, and they go everywhere preaching and teaching his word. What are we seeking? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
We were at Domino's. We took the graduates to Domino's uh, as a special treat. Pizza is very expensive in India, and these young men and women who come to the school are usually not wealthy at all. So we took them as a special treat, and Barnabas, the guy uh, on the far left, I've taught him for three years running, and he has always given me a hard time. He's a nice guy, but he'll p poke fun at you or give you a hard time about things. So we're sitting there in Domino's, and he says, uh, Brother Matthew. And I said, yeah, Barnabas. And I'm thinking, you know, he's going to throw some jab out there. He says, and he was trying to, he says, we have been talking about teaching the gospel in class. He goes, don't you think that it is time to teach the gospel? And I said, Barnabas, that is not Barnabas. I'm sorry, I'm saying Barnabas. His name's Samson. I said, Samson, that is a great idea. Come here. No, brother. No, brother. He said, no, Samson, come here. You know you're right. Come here. So we went around and met different people. And of course, he doesn't know the language. He's a Tamil man, and we're in the Northeast. But uh, these guys knew English. We found somebody who spoke English. And uh, I made Barnabas teach them in English, and then I spoke with them some in English. But it was a great reminder of, of something. It seems that it's very easy for us to get distracted by physical blessings. And while we enjoy the physical blessings, which we know every good gift and every perfect gift is from uh, the Father uh, from heaven, with whom is uh, 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 no variableness, neither shadow of turning, we know that every good gift comes down from him. And so when we, but when we celebrate and we enjoy those good gifts, like when we went to this place to eat pizza, why did I forget to seek God's righteousness in that place? Samson saw something. Here we are in a room full of people who were lost, but we're not talking to them because we are eating pizza. What a great lesson that if I, especially when I'm out enjoying the particular blessings of this life, if I can set the particular things that I like best in this world as reminders that these things came from God, and whenever I'm going to go enjoy them, let me also serve God. If I love pizza, if you love pizza, then why not set for a reminder for yourself is if I ever go to get pizza, I'm going to make sure that while I'm enjoying that wonderful blessing that I know came from God, I'm not just going to bow my head with my family and thank God for the pizza. I'm going to tell the people around me about the God that gave me the pizza. I've got to seek his righteousness. What is righteousness but simply right doing? It's right to do the right thing. And the right thing in that moment was to reach out to those in there who could understand us and teach them the gospel. This man had a profound impact on me. A lot of times we see homeless people in, and you don't really just want to hand a homeless, people, a homeless person a bunch of money all the time because those who work in that field tell us that's not usually helpful to them. You, you're, you, you can hurt them by doing that. Give them food, give them physical needs. But this man was not only homeless, he had pretty much, he had lost his mind. His mind was pretty much gone. We tried talking to him in multiple languages. He couldn't talk. It was also obvious that the people around him despised him. But that previous Friday in class, we had come to the scripture in Galatians where Peter and James accept Paul and Barnabas, and they say, we'll give you the right hand of fellowship, but they make one request of them. And the one request was, remember the poor. And Paul said, we had already planned to do that. And it made an impression on me. And I thought, I need to be more careful to take care of poor people as I go on my way. Don't avoid the poor man that everyone else seems to be avoiding. It was obvious the people around him detested him. They avoided him like the plague. So what we did was we went and we bought him food. It meant nothing to him. He couldn't even understand us. There was people behind him selling hot, hot, hot drinks, hot coffee. So we bought him some hot coffee to drink. It had no impact on him. However, while we were doing this, Josh is teaching a group of young ladies just behind us. Moreover, there's a group of young men just down from us who were impacted because they saw that we were doing for something, someone for something who could in no way return any kind of favor to us it led directly into a Bible study with those young men, which has become a continued Bible study through email. I don't know 
what the full blessing to just stopping and taking time for a poor person is with that particular poor person. And sometimes we may say that was a waste or they just squandered it. Or they're wicked. I, I, I can imagine that man may very well have been a wicked man and put himself in this position. I don't know. But I know this. I know that the people around us, including those men selling the coffee, were impacted by the fact that we took the time to give that man food. And not only give him food, but when we sat down next to him, we sat down right there with him and talked with him. We shook his hand. We touched him. Nobody was touching him. He's dirty. He's detested. But that's the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is not to go out and find middle class people who want to come to church with us. When, when John the Baptist was put in prison and he began doubting and he sent his disciples to Jesus to say, are you the one or do we wait for another? Well, how did Jesus respond to that question? That hit me before, and when I read this passage in Galatians as I was teaching it to these young people, you learn more, and the instructors here know this, you learn more from teaching than you do from sitting in a class. As I'm teaching these young men, especially if you're having to teach people things, when I have to tell poor people to take care of poor people and they know I'm rich, boy, that'll try your heart. I'm telling poor kids that they need to take care of poor people, and I'm the rich guy in the room. And so... That scripture came back to my mind, which had impacted me before, but in a different way, because Paul said, as part of my ministry, I will take care of poor people. But it reminds me when I go back and he says what? Jesus sent, a messengers, sent messengers back to John the Baptist to tell him, you tell him. And they list off the miracles. You tell John that the blind see. You tell John that the lame will. He lists off the miracles that are occurring. But at the end of that, there's one thing mentioned that's not miraculous. Or I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not a miracle, but it seems like a miracle to us sometimes if it happens. What is it? The poor have the gospel preached to them. That was one of the signs that Jesus was the Christ that he gave to his forerunner, John. Do I seek God's righteousness? Jesus had a heart for the poor. It says, all, and all these things shall be added unto you. And here is where we break the verse a lot of times. You know, if you will seek first the kingdom of God, you'll get an Xbox. If you seek first the kingdom of God, you'll get that Cadillac you've wanted. If you seek first the kingdom of God, you'll get that bigger house. No. What does the previous verse say? He says, don't give thought for what you'll eat, you'll drink, you'll wear. God is not giving you a Lexus because it is a natural spiritual law of seeking first the kingdom of God. You may get a Lexus. But that's not what he's talking about in Matthew 6.33. He says, and all these things shall be added unto you. And we have been taught, those of us who studied English very much, or those of us who studied in the Memphis School of Preaching, that if you see a pronoun, you must follow it back to its nearest logical antecedent. In this case, it is what? What to eat, what to drink, what to wear. These young people are enjoying pizza. It's food. It's a special food. But I'll tell you something, not one of them, they've been now two and a half years in the school of preaching, not one of them went to the school of preaching to get food. They went there, leaving their homes, leaving the people that spoke their own language, they went there with broken English to a place they'd never been before because they were seeking the kingdom of God. They wanted to learn how to preach the gospel. And they were fed day in and day out and here, on one of their last days, they were treated to something that they may, many of those people may never eat again. They really liked it, by the way. I've yet to meet someone who doesn't like pizza uh, in, in another country, uh, especially among the Indians. They, they like pizza. They, they, these things that we want will be added to us. That is not to say you'll have Mountain Dew. 
if you seek first the kingdom of God. But I will say this, and the reason that picture is, is pertinent, number one, it was a great time that Edison and I had, but we went to Village, and I, and I said to Edison, let's stop by and see Gautam. Gautam is a man who sells goods to the school, and we're really hoping that he'll obey the gospel. He's learned a lot. He's had several Bible studies. But we always try to stop by and just see him to encourage him to continue studying, to encourage him to obey the gospel. We stop by to see Gautam, and um, what do you know? We get to share a Mountain Dew, and not only that, it was a particularly hot day, and Gautam uh, went and turned his little fan on and blew it on us. And here we were. We just wanted to encourage the man, and we got cold drinks and uh, a fan blown on us. But what was our focus at the time? It's not about what blessings you have or don't have. There's nothing wrong with those young men and women eating pizza. It's not bad to have blessings. There's nothing wrong with us sharing a Mountain Dew and having a fan blown on us. It's not wrong to have blessings. It's a question of what am I seeking? Do I live my life trying to get the blessings or do I live my life trying to serve God and I enjoy the blessings when they come? The third thing was what you wear. The suit I'm wearing today the tie is from India. I got this for graduation. I didn't go to India planning to get a suit, but I found out when I got there that the suits there are rather inexpensive and I needed new suits. We got suits and I had to get shoes and so I'm also wearing my two and a half sizes two small shoes today. Um, every time you walked into a shoe store and told them your shoe size, they would look at you like you were crazy. They don't make them that size. Um, so I got two and a half sizes, two small shoes on. What will you wear? Those young people, let's see if they're here. Yeah, you see what those, those nice outfits those young people are wearing? Those were bought for them by the school. Probably the nicest clothing they own will be for, the, maybe, for some of them, that will be the nicest thing. That will be the nicest clothing they own for the rest of their lives. Yet again, what's the point though? Did they come to that school to get nice clothing? to be fed food, and to have, what do they get when they're in school? They get filtered water to drink. Indians like having filtered water to drink because their water is very bad for them. Did they come for that reason? No. Were they blessed with those things? Yes, they were. How do you preach this sermon in America? Because we have so many blessings. The answer is this. There's nothing wrong with being blessed. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. But what is first on my priority list? What is first? It's got to be God. So, We took mission trips while we were there. Those are the people that we got to teach. But ultimately, what was our mission in India? We taught the native people how to better teach their own people. And we grew spiritually as well. That's my class that I'm sitting with. That's Edison preaching. He preached a couple of times while we were there. Matthew 6.33 is a very simple concept. The question is, are you applying it in your life? If the answer to that is no, the question is, will you apply it in your life? Look at the last 48 hours and ask yourself, how much of it did I spend seeking God? And how much of it did I spend in pleasure? The great drug of America is not marijuana. It's not LSD. It's not heroin. It's not even alcohol. The great drug of America is pleasure. How much of that? There's nothing wrong with having pleasure. Except if it chokes God out of my life. I've got to put God first. What do they say the simple principle is? Eat your meal first and have your dessert after. The invitation is simple. Will you be a person who seeks God first? You can respond to that right now by, by this. Have you ever been crucified with Christ? Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Have you ever been crucified with Christ? You say, I don't know. I've been a religious person. Let me tell you how you're crucified with Christ, or let Paul tell you rather from Romans chapter 6. Know you not that as many of you as, as have been baptized into his death 
have put on Christ? Have you been baptized into the death of Christ? Paul goes on in Romans chapter 6 to tell us that that, that, that is how we are sig- uh, symbolically crucified with Jesus. That's where we contact the blood of Jesus. Have you done that? If you have not done that, let me ask you this question. Why not? You say, I don't know enough. Well, you've got a lot of time in your day. Would you study it? Put God first. Will you take the time to study that? Have you believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you've believed, then let that belief lead you to repent. Jesus said, uh, you'll die in your sins. Therefore, have I told you you'll die in your sins? For if you do not believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Will you repent? Repentance simply means a turning. It means churning away from what you were doing to what you should be doing. When a man is penitent, what will he do? He will confess Jesus Christ before other men. He'll simply stand up and say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Would you do that? Jesus says, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven, Matthew 10, 32. And will you be baptized in water for the remission of your sins, for the forgiveness of your sins, like they did so long ago on that day when Peter stood up and told them, you killed Jesus. The one we've waited for, you killed him. And they said, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And if you won't do that, let me ask you this. What idol are you worshiping? Are you too proud to? Is it because your parents didn't? Is it because your children? Is it because you'll lose Uh, you'll lose something in your life that you want to hold on to? What is it you're holding on to so tightly that you won't let go, put down your songbook, and be baptized for the remission of your sins? I've got to ask myself that question because I'm seeking then, I'm seeking God third, fourth, fifth, or sixth. He's somewhere down the list, but he's not first. Because if I would lay that thing down, then I would obey the gospel. And the same question goes for those who have been baptized into Christ. Are you crucified with Christ? Paul didn't say, I got crucified. He said, I am crucified. Are you still crucified? Are you still putting that old man of sin to death? Or are you holding on to some sin that you just can't let go of? You don't want to let go of it. Would you let go of it? Repent and ask for the prayers of your brothers and sisters. The time to do that is not tomorrow. The time to do that is now. The time to do that is not to say, very well, I will seek God's kingdom first, later. The time to do it is to say, no, starting right now in this moment, I will live a life that reflects Matthew 6.33. I will seek first the kingdom of God. I will put on Christ in baptism or I will come home to Jesus Christ. Would you do that while we stand and while we sing?